This is Naked Mormonism. I pledge my life, all that I may have. I will strive to the utmost of my ability to be what you would want me to be. It's time to find the truth. And having set our hand to the plow, we will never look back until this work is finished. Where is the church going? I have faith that the Constitution will be saved as prophesied by Joseph Smith. But it will not be saved in Washington. It will be saved by enlightened members of this church. The explicit tag is there for a reason. So if you get offended at what's said, it's not for you. But most importantly, may you ponder the truths you've heard. May they help you become even better than you were. Skepticize everything. Welcome to episode 49 of the Naked Mormonism podcast, the Serial Mormon History podcast. Today is Thursday, March 2nd, 2017. My name is Bryce Blankenagle, and thank you for joining me. Last historical episode was a little bit of a diversion from our usual, you know, like historical monologue format. The thing is, a, <laughs> there's simply no way to convey the terror and intensity of the Hans Mill Massacre. Many scholars and historians have done amazing work in reconstructing the historical events from the abundant first-hand accounts, but no medium is apt to actually make us feel what it was like to be there with the muskets firing and people wailing in agony and fear. I'm putting out an honest petition for feedback here. Did you guys enjoy that presentation of the Hans Mill Massacre? And do you want to hear episodes that are similar to it? You know, tweaked and optimized, of course. Or do you want us to kind of stick with the historical monologue from yours truly as every other historical episode has been up to this point? You know, it, we have a few other big events coming up. And if you guys would like episodes with uh, different people reading firsthand accounts will be reserved for those few big crucial events. Or like I said, we can just stick with the straight monologue. Let me know what you think. NakedMormonism at gmail.com. That being said, we don't have much to round up this week before we pick up our timeline. I mean, last episode was just that, the the most well-known and highly championed massacre in all of Mormon history, the Hans Mill Massacre. So let's just get into the meat of today's episode. The massacre at Hans Mill had happened just as the sun was setting on October 30th, as the dust settled, a messenger made his way too far west near midnight and reported to Joe what had just happened at Hans Mill. Uh, this had a few profound effects. Yeah, Joe suddenly realized that the saints living in the twin sanctuary cities of Far West and Diamond could be the next victims of mob assault. This had been a long time coming. Joe had been warned by multiple people that his actions over the previous month would serve to destroy the Mormons. That's, of course, referring to the Mormon depredations in Davies County. Here's a quote from George Hinkle. Now, Hinkle was a military leader overseeing the Mormon militia at Diamon. He'd been strategically involved with the entire conflict as one of Joe's closest trusted advisors, and he's an instrumental piece of today's episode. So I'm reading this from H. Michael Marquardt's Rise of Mormonism, page 480. Quote, Hinkle had told him that this course of things of burning houses and plundering of the Mormon troops would ruin us, that it could not be kept hid and would bring the force of the state upon us, that houses would be searched and stolen property found, end quote. So Hinkle was a wise and, in this case, truly prophetic man concerning the Missouri militias and how they would react to the Mormons' violence. Um, of course, they're going to answer it with more violence. We've had this discussion in the past. Uh, nothing was happening to de-escalate the situation, and Hinkle saw the writing on the wall. In response to this wise plea to cease and desist with the Mormon depredations, Joe chastised George Hinkle and told him to fall in line or get out of the way. He told him to, quote, Keep still, that I should say nothing about it, that it would discourage the men, and he would not suffer me to say anything about it. End quote. Herein lies the fundamental problem with incompetence. 
Granted, this specific counsel was given before the Battle of Crooked River and the Mormon extermination order, but Smith couldn't realize at that time the impossible odds with which he was faced. The Mormons had been stealing goods, and there's simply no way they could get away with it. Joe figured it was best to just sweep that problem under the rug and make sure that Hinkle doesn't talk about it, but he was really the only reasonable person giving Joe sound military advice in spite of Joe's blind optimism. Just because Joe was blindly optimistic about the outcome of the whole Mormon war, it doesn't mean there wasn't a certain amount of distrust for those who questioned Joe's military acumen, like Hinkle did, you know? After Hinkle dissented and gave Joe that great advice, advice which Joe clearly wanted to hear absolutely none of, but giving unwanted and necessary advice is the mark of a good advisor. You know, Joe, in response, demoted Hinkle and brought him back to Far West and took control over the militia at Diamond, commanding them by proxy from Far West. You know, as if Joe already didn't have enough problems, you know, spreading himself too thin with everything, he chose to take on direct command of an extra 300 men he wasn't directly commanding before. And Hinkle wasn't the only important military commander who was dissenting against Joe. Another who had been a close advisor during the entire conflict was Samson Avard, and he was known as one of the Danite captains, uh, one of the main primary leaders of the Danites. So let's just briefly, let's talk about the Danites and Samson Avard for a minute here. We've briefly mentioned him before now, but those were more just remarks about his physical appearance being like a dominating and powerful man, you know, a bad cop of the Danites, if you will. So the Danites were formed as the Mormon Enforcer Squad soon after Smith and Rigdon fled Kirtland for Missouri. The Danites were the muscle that enforced the Mormon ban on the Whitmers and all of our Cowdery and any other dissenters living in Missouri. They were a shady and extra legal underground armed mob force who obeyed the prophet regardless of his most insane orders, you know, like looting towns in Davies County. This is the Danite Oath, which later surfaced due to legal issues. Once again, I'm reading this from The Rise of Mormonism by H. Michael Marquardt, page 479, quote, In the name of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, I do solemnly obligate myself ever to conceal and never to reveal the secret purposes of this society called the Daughter of Zion. Should I ever do the same, I hold my life as the forfeiture, end quote. So, (laughs) kind of reminiscent of the temple rituals before the 90s. You know, they included the blood oaths which parishioners performed, you know, symbolically disemboweling themselves and cutting their own throats. That's the 1990s, by the way, not the 1890s when they changed that. But the idea that if you reveal the secret rituals performed in the temple, the penalty is death, you know, you know whether by your own hand by the, or by the hand of the Danites, I don't think that details too much matters. That was the same penalty for violating the Danite oath, only... They were a bit more serious than the Mormon church prior to, you know, the the blood oaths being taken out of the temple ceremony. Samson Avard was essentially head captain of the Danites and understandably held a lot of Mormon secrets concerning their military actions in the Missouri conflict. This is a great passage from the uh, page 469 of the Rise of Mormonism, and it describes the foundation and the basic organizational structure of the Danites, details which are important to keep in mind as this Mormon-Missouri war sits at a crucial tipping point after the Hans Mill Massacre. Quote, It appears that Joseph Smith, Sidney Rigdon, and Hiram Smith, members of the First Presidency, did not take the Danite oath as the Danites were to support their program. Rigdon mentioned in 1843 that the Danites were formed for mutual protection and they had certain signs and words by which they could know one another either by day or by night. In July, the Order of Danites was organized at Adam on Diamond, headed by Lyman White. The total number who joined the Danite organization at the two locations numbered in the hundreds. The leaders had military titles. There are no known minutes of the secret meetings where members were initiated. 
Reed Peck, who had been an adjutant with the Danites, mentioned the name of the leading officers of the Band of Danites. The following is a list of the officers. Captain General Jared Carter, replaced after July 4th by Elias Higby. Brigadier General Samson Avard. Major General Cornelius P. Lott. Colonel George W. Robinson. Lieutenant Colonel Philo Dibble. Major Seymour Brunson. End quote. All right, that was the layout of the commanding ranks of this Mormon enforcer squad, the Danites. You know, the, 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 they were formed a mere three months before the Mormon depredations in Davies County. So keep in mind, this was not actually the army of Israel. I think I have to make a correction. If I'm not mistaken, in the past few episodes, I believe I equivocated the army of Israel with the Danites, but that was wrong. In my defense... There's a fair amount of controversy surrounding the Danites and Joe's affiliation, while the Army of Israel was essentially an overarching broad term to describe any armed Mormon mob. So there's a fair amount of confusion. It's not just me. But when Joe marched those, uh, like the, the 200 men into Missouri back in 1834, you know, we, we refer to that as Zion's Camp. That was the actual foundation of the armies of Israel, to which Joe was elected commander in chief. And the term was later appropriated for the Mormon Battalion, established in 1846 to assist in the Mexican-American War. So the term army or armies of Israel is a broad term used to define basically any armed militia of Mormons. It's an umbrella catch-all term. But the Army of Israel's primary purpose in this 1838 Missouri conflict was the defense of Mormon settlements and performing publicly visible military actions, drilling and whatnot. Essentially, they were the Mormon National Guard, but they weren't making any aggressive public actions. The Danites, however, were a secret society existing for the purposes of directly handling ecclesiastical affairs. With handling the dissenters after Defection Day, for which D-Day David Whitmer was named, the Danites made them an offer that they couldn't refuse. You know, the, the old uh, Godfather line, I'm making an offer that can't refuse, you know what I'm saying? They would either leave far west or they'd be killed. You can go back to the Red Sermon on episode 43 to hear this whole thing in detail. But to reiterate and kind of help contextualize the end of October crisis afflicting the Mormons and Joe specifically, let's briefly go over some of the highlights here. The Danite Manifesto was written by Hingepin Sidney Rigdon and delivered to Ollie Cowdung, Oliver Cowdery, John Goebbels Whitmer, William Wines, or as we know him, Double Dub Phelps, and Leadfoot Lyman E. Johnson. Um, it was delivered by the rough and tough bad cop Brigadier General Sampson Avard. And part of the letter reads, quote, for out of the country you shall go, and no power shall save you. And you shall have three days after you receive this communication to you, including 24 hours in each day, for you to depart with your families peaceably, which you may do undisturbed by any person. But in that time, if you do not depart, we will use the means in our power to cause you to depart. For go you shall. End quote. This was a public death threat attributed to Rigdon, commanding Samson Avard to direct the Danites to aggressively chase out or kill these Mormon dissenters. We're talking about Ollie and the Whitmers here, people who'd been there since the foundation of the church. You know, these people had witnessed Joe drunkenly staring into his hat, just rambling verse after verse for the Book of Mormon. These foundational leaders in the church all fled upon receiving the threat. And many of those people were Joe's deepest friends, with whom he'd shared the best and the worst of times. But those people were also really pissed with how much of a bag of dicks Joe had been for years up to this point, and in no small part to the Fanny Alger affair. Just to take a, a quick aside here, we tended to cover the worst of times a lot, so here's a great example of the best of times, and this is recounted by Professor Bill, you know, William E. McClellan, and this is taken from page 100 of Hearts Made Glad by Lamar Peterson, quote, soon fine dressing and fine parties were the go, and soon a fine ride was determined upon. Some 15 couples hired fine carriages with fine harness and horses, 
and when all was in readiness, they set out for Cleveland some 19 miles away. They drove round and round through the streets. People gazed and inquired, who is all this? Oh, it's Joe Smith, the Mormon prophet, and his company. They put up at a first-class tavern, called for a room, refreshments, and something to drink. Some of them became intoxicated, and they broke up about $20 worth of dishes and furniture. Next morning, that was all Hiram Smith, by the way. <laughs> That's what they claimed. Next morning, they paid their bill and set out for home. They stopped at Euclid halfway and took dinner again. And after they set out for home, they commenced running horses and turned over a buggy and broke it up. So they had to haul it home on a wagon. But all went swimmingly, end quote. So, I mean, <laughs> those people who... Joe shared this crazy party night with, you know, and they they tried to drive home drunk and flipped over a carriage. <laughs> Those people who had been friends with Joe for many years were forcibly removed from Far West after Sidney Rigdon issued the Danite Manifesto. You know, it must have caused unimaginable problems for Joe and the leadership, not to mention the personal friendships that were forever severed. Add that background pressure to George Hinkle telling Joe that the Mormon depredations in Davies County will essentially be the downfall of the Mormons in Missouri, and things are starting to get a little tense for Joe. As I said earlier, George Hinkle wasn't alone in telling Joe that he's making some gigantic fuck-ups with his military acumen. Thomas B. Marsh, hey, Dorsh, and Orson Lehydem, or Orson Hyde, also known as the Olive Branch of Israel, also told Joe that the Mormon depredations in Davies County were a huge mistake, and some form of altercation must have happened because both Orson Hyde and Thomas B. Marsh went to Richmond and wrote affidavits telling all about the Destroying Company and the Danites. Now, Darsh made some incredibly inflammatory claims in the affidavit, which Lahaydem affirmed as wholly true. Here are some of the operative phrases that really caused a number of problems. Quote, Joseph Smith, the prophet, had preached, in which he said, that all the Mormons who refused to take up arms, if necessary, in difficulties with the citizens, should be shot or otherwise put to death. Um, here's a quote from later on. Commanded by a fictitiously named Captain Fearnot, the Mormons marched to Gallatin. They returned and said they had run off from Gallatin, 20 or 30 men, and had taken Gallatin, had taken one prisoner, and another had joined the company. I afterwards learned from the Mormons that they had burnt Gallatin, and that it was done by the aforesaid company that marched down. The Mormons informed me that they had hauled away all the goods from the store in Gallatin and deposited them at the bishop's storehouse in Diamond. From later in his affidavit... The prophet, on hearing the property was left, commenced a reply and said, We had better see to it, and then White stopped him by saying, Never mind, we will have private counsel. And Smith replied, Very well. The private counsel I did not hear. The men were determined to go to their camps. The same evening, a number of footmen came from the direction of Millport, laden with property, which I was informed consisted of beds, clocks, and other household furniture. Uh, here's from even later on in this affidavit. It's huge, by the way. This affidavit I'm reading from, from is massive. It'd take us forever to read through it. So I'm just grabbing little important excerpts here. Um, this one is great, though. When White returned from Millport and informed Smith that the people were gone and the property left, Smith asked him if they had left any of the Negroes for them. And White replied, no, upon which someone laughed and said to Smith, you have lost your Negro then. <laughs> Joe was hoping to loot a slave in this case. It's really fucked up. Uh, another passage here. They passed a decree that no Mormon dissenter should leave Caldwell County alive, and that such as attempted to do it should be shot down and sent to tell their tale in eternity. In a conversation between Dr. Avard, that's Samson Avard, and other Mormons, said Avard proposed to start a pestilence among the Gentiles, as he called them, by poisoning their corn, fruit, etc., and saying it was the work of the Lord. And said Avard advocated lying for the support of their religion and said it was no harm to lie for the Lord. Samson Avard is kind of a son of a bitch here. 
The plan of said Smith, the prophet, is to take this state, and he professes to his people to intend taking the United States and ultimately the whole world. Um, Which is even more terrifying when you read later on. It is believed by every true Mormon that Smith's prophecies are superior to the law of the land. I have heard the prophet say that he should yet tread down his enemies and walk over their dead bodies. And then the Muhammad quote comes a little bit after that. But there's one more passage to read out of this, and it really helps to contextualize what happened. They have among a company consisting of all that are considered true Mormons called the Danites, who have taken an oath to support the heads of the church in all things that they say or do, whether right or wrong. Many, however, of this band are much dissatisfied with this oath as being against moral and religious principles. On Saturday last, I am informed by the Mormons that they had a meeting at Far West at which they appointed a company of twelve by the name of the Destruction Company for the purpose of burning and destroying and that if the people of Buncombe came to do mischief upon the people of Caldwell and committed depredations upon the Mormons, they were to burn Buncombe, and if the people of Clay and Ray made any movements against them, this destroying company were to burn liberty in Richmond, end quote. That is the affidavit given by Thomas B. Marsh and affirmed by Orson Hyde. Now, in response to this information, um, of course, which Joe later claimed to be false, the militia commanded by Colonel Thomas Jennings in Liberty Clay County organized his militia of 250 men and marched on Hans Mill, which Joe had just now learned of. Now, Joe hadn't known that Darshan Lahaydem had betrayed him and signed these affidavits, he only found out by hearing about the Hans Mill massacre, which stemmed from their affidavits. Now, is this convoluted string of linked causal factors beginning to come into focus yet? You know, Thomas Darsh and Orson Lahaydem had participated in Danite activities, and more importantly, had taken the Danite oath saying if they reveal Danite secrets, then they forfeit their lives. They dissented from Joe and revealed to the Missouri government the Mormon plans and strategies, laying bare previously unknown details of the Mormon depredations. Their intel led directly to the Hans Mill Massacre. When Joe learned of the massacre late in the night of October 30th, right after it happened, this was his response, which is accurate. Now, I'm reading this from page 163 of Stephen LeSueur's 1838 Mormon War in Missouri. Quote, Joseph Smith repeatedly warned the Hans Mill Saints to move into far west for safety, but due to a misunderstanding of the prophet's instructions, they chose to remain at the village, trusting in the Lord and their recently signed treaty to protect them. None had ever been killed who abode by my counsel, Smith later said, and Hans Mill the brethren went contrary to my counsel. If they had not, their lives would have been spared, end quote. That's that's kind of a douchebag move to pull an I told you so in the wake of 18 of his flock being slaughtered. But Joe also wasn't wrong. He'd given counsel for the Mormons to leave Hans Mill, but Jacob Hahn said that he could defend the mill, that the, the Mormons there would be able to hold it down. But they needed the mill. I mean, it was the only mill in Caldwell County the Mormons could access to grind their wheat and corn into flour and meal. So once Hans Mill fell, it signaled to Joe and the leadership that their time in Far West was short. They were out of options. And the few Missouri militia generals who'd been friendly to the Mormons were now under the command of General John B. Clark, who was not friendly to the Mormons, and they were all mingled together with this other anti-Mormon military commanders like uh, General Lucas, Captain Bogart, Captain Austin, and all of these guys. So all of these militia commanders were gathered outside of Far West in Diamond, and they were cutting off the Mormons from any of their supply lines, 
and strictly limiting their communications with one another. You know, they were capturing nearly any Mormon who stepped foot outside of the sanctuary cities, you know, far west in Diamond. And maybe sanctuary is the wrong label for those towns at this point. I mean, they were actually just the last holdout cities of refuge for the Mormons who'd been removed from the neighboring counties. The Mormons had been consolidated over the course of multiple weeks now to these two locations, which were now completely surrounded and under siege by the Missouri militia. The Mormons were truly out of options. There's no way around that. October 31st, 1838, the day after Hans Mill Massacre, was a very tense day for the Mormon leadership. The Missouri militia was armed with the Mormon extermination order, which gave them quasi-legal carte blanche to do whatever necessary to the Mormons to remove them from Missouri. Uh, Stephen LeSueur, once again, captures this situation quite well. This is on page 168 of his book, quote, News of the massacre seemed to change Joseph Smith's perception of the conflict. He not only saw that the Mormons could not win an all-out war with the Missourians, but he also realized that his people would be utterly destroyed if such a war occurred. He now pressed the five representatives to work out a compromise with the militia. Both Reed Peck and John Corll wrote that Smith instructed them to, quote, beg like a dog for peace, end quote. Hinkle reported that Smith told them to obtain a treaty, quote, on any terms short of a battle, end quote. According to Coral, Smith said he would go to prison for 20 years or even die rather than allow his people to be exterminated. When the appointed time arrived, the Mormon representatives, with clear instructions from Smith to seek a compromise, rode out to meet the Missouri officers, end quote. So... All of the pressures we've been discussing for the past seven historical timeline episodes since Joe and Rigdon got to Missouri finally culminated in this Hans Mill massacre, and that shocked Joe's system into comprehending just how real this conflict was. He and Rigdon had been preaching for months that they would rather die than be chased out of Missouri and or, you know, like removed from their homes again, like they'd been so many times. But now that Mormons had actually died and the rest of the thousands of believers were on the Missourians chopping block, it was time to get serious about surrender negotiations and face the consequences. Joe was defeated. He knew that if he personally went out to meet General Lucas to negotiate surrender terms, he would be immediately captured and the Mormons would lose all of their negotiation leverage. The Missourians wanted the Mormons out, but they really wanted Joe and the church leadership to answer for their crimes. The Mormon liaisons rode out to General Lucas's 4,000 strong militia outside of Far West. Lucas assured the Mormons that he would not be as harsh as the governor had described in the Mormon extermination order and that a peaceful surrender was possible if they fulfilled his terms of surrender. And those terms are as follows. First, to give up their leaders to be tried and punished. Second, to make an appropriation of their property, all who had taken up arms to the payment of their debts and indemnify for damage done by them. Third, that the balance should leave the state, that's meaning the rest of the Mormons, and be protected out by the militia, but not be permitted to remain under protection until further orders were received from the commander-in-chief. And fourth, the sticking point, to give up the arms of every description to be receded for, end quote. As is the nature of nearly any surrender, the outlook wasn't good for the Mormons, and giving the Missouri militia the Mormon leadership was the only leverage they had which was sufficient for negotiating better terms with General Lucas. Now keep in mind, General Lucas was armed with the extermination order, but the order was addressed to General John B. Clark, who was actually the commanding officer over General Lucas. Lucas didn't actually have the quasi-legal authority enshrined in the extermination order, and General Clark, who actually did have that authority, was still en route and wouldn't arrive for another four days. But what could the Mormons do? 
They could scream and cry foul all they wanted, but at the end of the day, they were still surrounded by an army that outnumbered them five to one, which was under the command of General Lucas, who was itching to kill him some damned Mormon fanatics. Colonel George Hinkle, you know, the, this primary representative of the Mormon interests, reportedly refused the terms of surrender as soon as General Lucas stated them. But there was no possible way to get around the terms. They're completely logical and consistent with the vast majority of respectful military surrenders throughout history. The point Hinkle was stuck on was the surrender of the Mormon's guns. An argument ensued between Hinkle and General Lucas, and Lucas essentially said you can comply with the terms, or we will wage battle on Far West right now, starting with U-5 messengers. So Hinkle took the threat seriously. He asked General Lucas if they could wait out the rest of the night and come back with a decision the next morning. Lucas said, okay, but he needed some extra collateral assuring that they would come back with a decision the next morning instead of just holding out and biding their time until Clark got there. So Lucas demanded Joe Rigdon, Lyman White, P. Cubed Parley, P. Pratt, and Rigdon's son-in-law, George Robinson, to be surrendered as hostages. Without the leaders in Lucas's hand, there was nothing guaranteeing the Mormons' agreement to or compliance with the surrender terms. So Hinkle said, we'll get back to you on that. And the five messengers hauled as much ass as they possibly could back to Far West to discuss the surrender terms with Joe. General Lucas gave them one hour to surrender the leadership or his army would destroy Far West that night, beginning with bombarding the town with cannon fire. Lucas's troops were camped less than a mile from Far West. So it didn't take long for Hinkle and the four other messengers to get back to Joe and tell him just how supremely fucked they were. Joe initially refused the surrender terms, but Hinkle told him just how insistent General Lucas was about the terms and that no other negotiation would be accepted and that they were running out of time. And finally, with no options left, Joe, Rigdon, P. Cubed, Lyman White, and George Robinson mounted up on their horses and made their final ride out of Far West. Now, they must have been incredibly close to that one hour that Lucas gave them to comply because General Lucas met the Mormon leaders with a massive contingency of his troops marching towards Far West in order to enforce his terms should the Mormons refuse to comply. Just to clarify, the leadership giving themselves up was merely for collateral, now, they could still try and negotiate terms with General Lucas and decide to accept or decline the terms in the morning of November 1st. They were merely being taken hostage by Lucas's troops until then. This is how P. Cubed, partly P. Pratt, recounts the situation on page 203 of his autobiography, and it is linked in the show notes. Quote, October 31st, 1838. In the afternoon, we were informed that the governor had ordered his force against us with orders to exterminate or drive every Mormon from the state. As soon as these facts were ascertained, we determined not to resist anything in the shape of authority, however abused. We had now nothing to do but to submit to be massacred, driven, robbed, or plundered at the option of our persecutors." Colonel George M. Hinkle, who was, at the time, the highest officer of the militia assembled for the defense of Far West, waited on Mrs. J. Smith, S. Rigdon, Hiram Smith, L. White, George Robinson, and myself, with a request from General Lucas that we would repair to his camp, with the assurance that as soon as peaceable agreements could be entered into, we should be released. We had no confidence in the word of a murderer and a robber, but there was no alternative but to put ourselves into the hands of such monsters or to have the city attacked and men, women, and children massacred. We, therefore, commended ourselves to the Lord and voluntarily surrendered as sheep into the hands of wolves. As we approached the camp of the enemy, General Lucas rode out to meet us with a guard of several hundred men." End quote. All right, we're going to let P cubed tell us what happened next momentarily, but let's just take a second to assess this shit taco Joe had been wedged into. 
General Lucas had been one of the most active and outspoken anti-Mormons in the Missouri militia. The wolf had successfully coaxed the sheep out of the pen. The Mormons had absolutely no reason to trust that Lucas would play fair, especially given the massacre that had just happened the night before at the hands of Colonel Thomas Jennings, who had been absorbed as reinforcements to this state militia outside of Far West. That means that many of the men who had just killed Mormons at the Hans Mill Massacre were standing in the ranks of Lucas's army of 2,500 men who'd actively mobilized to meet the Mormon leaders in no man's land. Can we see why Hinkle and literally every other Mormon were all a bit apprehensive to give up their arms and comply to Lucas's surrender terms? Without the Mormons being armed, what stops this anti-Mormon mob from literally carrying out Boggs' extermination order and just sweeping through Far West in one afternoon killing every Mormon they could? I mean, nothing is the answer to that question. There was nothing but a thin veneer of law stopping Lucas from killing every Mormon in Missouri, and the extermination order provided the loophole necessary to make his actions non-prosecutable. There's no possible way to understand just how terrifying this situation was for every Mormon involved. It gets even more confusing when you factor the local media into the equation. We're going to read some news clippings um, kind of near the end of the episode after we find out how everything else went down here uh, over the next couple days. So continuing on in the autobiography of P-Cubed, Parley P. Pratt on page 204, quote, The haughty General Lucas rode up and without speaking to us, instantly ordered his guard to surround us. They did so very abruptly and we were marched into camp surrounded by thousands of savage looking beings many of whom were dressed and painted like Indian warriors. These all set up a constant yell like so many bloodhounds let loose upon their prey, as if they had achieved one of the most miraculous victories that ever graced the annals of the world. If the vision of the infernal regions could suddenly open to the mind with thousands of malicious fiends, all clamoring, exulting, deriding, blaspheming, mocking, railing, raging, and foaming like a troubled sea— then could some idea be formed of the hell which we had entered, end quote. Stephen Lesseur describes the situation when the leaders were taken hostage, um, but I can't seem to find the source he's using, so it's probably a bit editorialized, so I'm just qualifying this here. But it shows us that there were a few remaining white knights who defend the law regardless of who was right or wrong in the situation. This is from page 172 of Stephen Lesseur's book, quote, as Hinkle and the others rode off, the Missouri troops closed around the prisoners and began shouting triumphantly. Some of the men, guns cocked, rushed in and threatened to shoot the hostages. General Donovan and several other officers rode up with drawn swords, drove the men back, threatening to cut them down if they did not uncock their guns and move away. At camp, many of the Missouri soldiers continued to insult and threaten the Mormon prisoners. Consequently, Lucas placed a guard of 30 soldiers in a double ring around the Mormons to protect them. The Mormon leaders spent the entire night on open ground, in the cold and rain, surrounded by thousands of hostile troops. They were given no opportunity to discuss the surrender terms with the militia officers." End quote. P-Cubed is a little more descriptive of this evening, so let's continue on in page 204 of his autobiography. Quote, In camp, we were placed under a strong guard and were without shelter during the night, lying on the ground in the open air in the midst of a great rain. The guards during the whole night kept up a constant tirade of mockery and the most obscene blackguardism and abuse. They blasphemed God mocked Jesus Christ, swore the most dreadful oaths, taunted Brother Joseph and others, demanded miracles, wanted signs such as, Come, Mr. Smith, show us an angel. Give us one of your revelations. Show us a miracle. Come, there is one of your brethren here in camp who we took prisoner yesterday in his own house and knocked his brains out with his own rifle, which we found hanging over his fireplace. He lays speechless and dying. Speak the word and heal him, and then we will all believe. Or, 
If you are apostles or men of God, deliver yourselves, and then we will all be Mormons. Those were all quotes from the mob, going back to Parley Pratt. Next would be a volley of oaths and blasphemies, then a tumultuous tirade of lewd boastings of having defiled virgins and wives by force, etc., much of which I dare not write. And, indeed, language would fail me to attempt more than a faint description. Thus passed this dreadful night, and before morning several other captors were added to our number, among whom was Brother Amasa Lyman. End quote. Okay, we'll attempt to deal with that last claim of rape in a little while, as it's a very loaded accusation, and there's a lot more to it than meets the eye. But let's talk about the treatment of the Mormon prisoners in Lucas's military camp. Now, historians may disagree about how they were treated, but it seems entirely possible that the majority of what P-Cubed, Parley Pratt, claimed in his autobiography is entirely believable. I mean, this state-sanctioned militia, as was the case with every other Missouri militia up to this point, was comprised wholly of Missouri citizens, many who hated those damn religious fanatics known as the Mormons, that's a quote. I mean, they'd, they'd been fighting with them for years by this point. And given the social pressures we've discussed ad nauseum by this point, the Missourians would stoop to unprecedented lows to disparage Joe and his followers. They had beat the brains out of a man named John Tanner. And this is how the situation is recounted by Stephen Lesseur on page 148. Quote, John Tanner and his son Myron were driving their wagon to a mill to obtain provisions for the Mormon army when they spotted a company of Missourians riding toward them. Tanner told his 12-year-old son to hide in the woods and make his way home as best he could. Although the elder Tanner made no attempt to escape, Meyer Odell, captain of the militia unit, shot twice at the Mormon as he rode toward the wagon, his gun misfiring each time. Upon reaching the wagon, Odell called Tanner a, quote, goddamned old Mormon and struck him on the side of the head with the butt of his rifle. Tanner suffered a large, ugly gash, but his thick felt hat partially cushioned the blow and prevented more serious injury to the 60-year-old man. The stunned Mormon was taken as a prisoner to the Missouri's camp, end quote, and that was outside Far West. This Missouri militia had beaten this old man nearly to death and took him prisoner, and when they finally took delivery of Joe as prisoner, they made fun of him, telling him, you know, heal the old man that they had nearly killed. Okay, two things to say about this. A, what a bunch of dicks, and B, eh, good on them, okay? Joe and his missionaries had claimed many times that they could perform healing, and what better scenario to convert these thousands of anti-Mormon mobsters than to heal a man they'd nearly killed by hitting him on the head with his own gun. They set up a testable situation, and the prophet could have intervened in a meaningful way and converted all of them on the spot. But he didn't. He wasn't capable of doing so. So, Lesueur tends to take the perspective that the Mormon leader's time in Lucas's camp wasn't quite as bad as some, like, P-cubed claim. But I disagree. This account may be somewhat exaggerated, as it were, other ones, but it wasn't a pleasant situation. I mean, they were kept up all night in an open field with freezing cold November Missouri rain while being constantly bombarded by verbal jabs from the Missouri militia. You know, what if the line broke? You know, that, that, that double ring of guards. I mean, what if some of those guards decided to commit mutiny? You know, what if their old friend General Donovan wouldn't have been there to defend them when all the shit went down? I mean, the fear of the unknown and the very real mistreatment they received, it's completely unquantifiable when viewing it from our perspective today. But the Mormons remaining at Far West weren't sure what to expect the following morning. You know, would their prophet escape and return to wage war against the militia? Or would he emerge from Lucas's army with terms of surrender? Would the militia exercise their extra legal authority granted by the extermination order and then just ignore any surrender terms and go and just wipe out the Mormons now that they capture Joe and other key Mormon leaders? 
for the fear of the unknown of the thousands of people living in Far West, I personally doubt they shared a collective wink of sleep that entire night. But Boggs had issued the extermination order in response to the Mormon aggression against Captain Bogart's troops on Crooked River. The Mormons knew that anybody associated with Crooked River battle would be treated with extreme prejudice by Lucas's troops, and of course the larger Missouri militia. Most of those men were in Far West at the time, so 70 men who'd participated or had been linked to the Crooked River battle fled at midnight towards the Iowa Territory, only to return once the dust had settled for the purpose of removing their families to Illinois. So the next morning, November 1st, dawned. A messenger from Lucas's army arrived in Far West with explicit instructions from Joe to George Hinkle to surrender and comply with Lucas's surrender terms. The Mormons, they were ready to fight, but obviously they must have been expecting a surrender. Otherwise, they wouldn't have sent off those 70 fighting men in the middle of the night. Had they been expecting a battle, they would have been. They would have used those men. George Hinkle, he was commander in chief in Joe's absence. Once he received Joe's order to surrender, he organized the logistics and sent a messenger to Diamond, validating the claims of the militia there that the Mormons had surrendered. So this confusing morning of November first is described well by Lesueur on page one seventy five. Quote. The Mormon hostages spent the entire night surrounded by hostile troops, listening to boasts and threats of violence. The following morning, 1st of November, General Lucas informed them that they could surrender and accept the terms offered, or they could fight and be exterminated by the Missouri troops. According to Joseph Thorpe, a member of Donovan's brigade, Lyman White was the only hostage who wanted to return to town. They were about as badly scared set as I ever saw, Thorpe said concerning the hostages, except old Wright, sick, who stood like a lion and said, fight, without a sign of fear about him. At about 8 a.m., Joseph Smith sent a messenger to Far West instructing the saints to surrender. So many Mormons simply didn't believe it. I mean... They'd heard Joe and Rigdon's firebrand preaching about this war of extermination they would wage against the damn mobocrats. Um, Here's a quote from uh, the Reed Peck manuscript, and it's linked in the show notes. Quote, Joseph Smith addressed them, and after capitulating the vexations to which the church had been subject and the persecutions they had endured in Missouri, informed them of the answer to the governor to their petition, and in continuation said the law... We have tried long enough. Who is so big a fool as to cry the law, the law, when it is always administered against us and never in our favor? I do not intend to regard the law hereafter, as we are made a set of outlaws by having no protection from it. We will take our affairs into our own hands and manage for ourselves. We have applied to the governor, and he will do nothing for us. The militia of the county we have tried, and they will do nothing. All are mob. The governor is mob. The militia are mob, and the whole state is mob. We have yielded to the mob in due wit, and now they are preparing to strike a blow in Davies. But I am determined that we will not give another foot, and I care not how many come against us, ten or ten thousand. God will send his angels to our deliverance, and we can conquer ten thousand as easily as ten, end quote. So here is another quote from a man named Samuel Kimball concerning something that Joe said regarding the mobs taken from the later court documents. And I'm reading this from page 481 of Marquardt's Rise of Mormonism. Quote, It was impossible to please a mob that he had applied to the governor, that he understood the governor said he could do nothing for us. He said the whole state was a mob, the governor was nothing but a mob, and if he come upon them, he would make war upon them. He cursed the state as a damn mob, and that God would damn them. He observed that the people might think he was swearing, but that the Lord would not take notice of it. End quote. So after that kind of rhetoric, surrender didn't seem like an option. And once agreed upon by Joe, it didn't seem like a reality 
to his thousands of faithful followers who would be adversely affected by this surrender. Now, this problem stems from a fundamental misunderstanding of how war works and a misplacement of trust in Joe as the prophet of God. These men were supposedly fighting with God on their side and considered defeat completely impossible because God was watching over them. You know, they they understood that as God's army, just like the 2,000 stripling warriors in the Book of Mormon, they could take on, quote, 10 as easily as 10,000 with God's protection. But they were just simply ignorant of how war really works. So Hinkle gathered the Mormon soldiers to the middle of Far West and told them what happened, and that they surrendered. And the majority of them were incredulous, thinking that Joe and the other leaders had been unfairly captured and that Hinkle was just pulling the wool over their eyes. Some Mormons who claimed they were ready to fight to the death considered George Hinkle as a traitor, working for General Lucas to subvert the captured Mormon leaders. Nobody was sure what to believe. But regardless of what the Mormons believed, the reality was that the surrender was official, and Joe would never return to Far West. Lucas's army then carried out the terms which weren't so much negotiated as they were dictated, and I would go find a bunch of first-hand accounts to reconstruct the sacking of Far West and Diamond, but I'd much rather rely on a trusted historian instead of my amateur self, so I'm just going to read a fairly large excerpt from Stephen Lesur's book, uh, so bear with me, and I'll just once again recommend the 1838 Mormon War in Missouri. Read it for yourself, please. There are so many details we simply don't have time to cover, and it will really help to paint a higher resolution picture of this conflict if you read it for yourself. This is beginning with page 180. Quote, The disarming of Mormon soldiers opened the way for widespread plundering and violence against the saints that continued until they left the state. Missouri soldiers ransacked homes, some looking for property allegedly stolen from them. Others simply searched for booty, while the Mormon owners looked helplessly on. William E. McClellan, Professor Bill, he makes an appearance. A former Mormon apostle led a search of Joseph Smith's home to confiscate books and papers that might prove damaging to the Mormons. The Danite Constitution was reportedly found in a trunk filled with the prophet's personal papers. Josiah Butterfield said the Missourians would enter homes during the night, awaken the Mormons with cocked guns, and then search the houses for weapons and take whatever they pleased. A gang of eight men catching William Clark alone beat him up because, You're a goddamn Mormon preacher, and we are determined to kill every Mormon, that's a quote. In Carroll County, a mob captured Riley Stewart and, holding two pistols at his head, forced him to take off his coat, kneel down, and receive 50 lashes. James Powell, a non-Mormon whose wife belonged to the church, was clubbed senseless by a group of Missourians when he resisted their attempts to take possession of his property and home. Powell received a six-inch gash in his head, exposing his brain, and a doctor later removed 14 pieces of bone from his skull. Swearing they would indemnify themselves for Mormon damages in Davies County, the Missourians warned Powell's wife and her parents, who witnessed the entire affair, to be gone by early breakfast time the next morning or they would kill every one of us. That's another quote. At Far West, several Mormon families crowded into each small cabin for shelter. Many lived in tents and slept near fires to keep warm during the night. The Missouri soldiers lived off the Mormons' livestock and crops and used their house logs for fire, while the Mormons ate frozen potatoes and boiled corn. The soldiers reportedly shot hogs and cattle for sport, claiming the animals were Mormons running away on all fours. According to Mormon reports, the soldiers also raped several women. The accusations of rape, which were promptly denied by Missouri officials, are difficult to verify, yet there are at least two eyewitness accounts of attempted rapes, and the evidence indicates that the soldiers brazenly threatened the unprotected Mormon women. Mercy Thompson, whose husband fled the state the night before the surrender, said she lived in such constant terror that at times I feared to lay my babe down lest they should slay me and leave it to suffer worse than immediate death. End quote. 
As I said, it was a bit of a long excerpt, but any reconstruction of these events that I attempted would just simply be inadequate. So this sacking of Far West and Diamond truly would have been a horrifying experience to live through. There's no way of getting around that. The thousands of absolutely terror-struck Mormons were running and hiding from the thousands of anti-Mormon soldiers who were pillaging and destroying their homes and properties, you know, killing their livestock, and, if some accounts are to be believed, raping Mormon women. Lesueur contends with that point in a footnote on the bottom of page 181, and this is what he says about it, quote, Nearly all reports of rape are based on hearsay and rumors. No shit. In addition, the reports are generally vague and often exaggerated. Brigham Young, for example, said that several Mormon women were ravished to death, but it cannot be expected that the victims would readily reveal details of these incidents. Parley P. Pratt said one of the victims verified that she had been raped, but delicacy at present forbids my mentioning the names. Charles Moorhead, the representative of the state legislature from Ray County, said during a debate that he was in Far West when one of these reports of rape was started, and he assisted in attempting to ascertain the truth, and the Mormons themselves admitted that it was false, end quote. Okay, there's really a lot to parse out there, and I think Lesur gets to a foundational problem with allegations of rape when he said, it cannot be expected that the victims would readily reveal details of the incidents. And he hits it home even more when he says that reports are based on hearsay and rumors. What hard evidence would we expect to find given the raping actually occurred? Do we really expect to find a woman's journal entry telling about how she was raped? I mean... <laughs> Rape isn't usually something that a person discusses with their most trusted friends or family members. Why would we expect to find any hard evidence substantiating such allegations? But the way that our culture views rape is out of sight, out of mind, right? And it often ends in victim blaming. How much more was rape swept under the rug in 19th century puritanical frontier America? I mean... Today, we have a fundamentally broken perception of rape. You know, it begins with lack of education concerning the matter, and it ends with systematic underreporting and widespread silencing, further perpetuating the problem. Many of those who suffer through rape won't share that information with even those who should have that information for many different reasons. People will go with unchecked PTSD for years after an incident because talking about it is too traumatic or they feel like it was their fault or something. An ancillary point I'm trying to make is that the silence on these matters only sweeps them further under the rug and just not believing in rape allegations because it just doesn't seem plausible or whatever, that makes the problem even worse. Education and prevention of rape is the only way we can better our society in this regard. The primary point that I want to make here relates to how we qualify evidence of rape, right? I mean, evidence for rape, what do we expect? Historically speaking, men have been raiding and pillaging civilizations they just conquered for longer than we have written history. One common underlying theme with any of these conquerings is widespread rape. From the sacking of Carthage to the Blitzkrieg of Poland, violent men have been taking advantage and raping women by the millions. The vast majority of the evidence we have for those rapes comes from hearsay and rumor because women don't tend to talk about it, even if it's with someone they trust who should probably know that information. It's, I, and I'm, I shouldn't say that it's always just man-on-woman rape, but it's statistically speaking, it's much more prevalent. But I have to qualify that, but I'm not pointing this out for the sake of, you know, calling out how fucked up humans are, because that goes without saying. I'm trying to qualify what scant evidence exists of some rapes occurring in Far West or Diamond when the Missouris conquered them after the Mormons surrender. Hard evidence of these rapes simply doesn't exist, nor would we expect it to. Only hearsay and rumors 
and complete denials of those hearsay and rumors by those in charge of the men who pillaged the cities and allegedly committed the raping in the first place. You know, there's no way for us to know if it really did happen. But personally, I prefer to play it safe and say, if there are allegations of rape, then it probably happened. But I have to qualify the situation even further, all right? The, the surrender of the Mormons at Diamond and Far West was no sacking of Carthage or Blitzkrieg of Poland. You know, supposedly 350 of the 400,000 people living in Carthage were killed and the rest were sold into slavery before the city was leveled. And then some 200,000 casualties resulted from the invasion of Poland and 420,000 were taken prisoner who, you know, the, the vast majority of them died later in death camps. But those sackings were on a completely different level and scale. You know, all said and done, very few Mormons were directly killed by Missourians during the days following the surrender. You know, a significant number died of starvation and exposure during the following winter, but the 18 who died at Hans Mill were the only Mormons who really felt the wrath of the Missouri muskets. But of course, things didn't get better for the captured leaders, while Far West and Diamond were plundered by the Missouri militia. Because General Lucas was so viciously opposed to the Mormons, he decided to hold court-martials for Joe and the other leaders. Now, to clarify, court-martials are held for members of the military when they step out of line, but none of the Mormon leaders in that camp were actually members of the Missouri State Militia, so, General Lucas had absolutely zero authority to hold this military tribunal. Simple as that. But according to some accounts, Judge Austin A. King, you know, that same judge who'd presided over the trial of Joe and Lyman White at that guy's farm back in early September, was present, along with some other important people who voted in the trial. But even just saying that makes this sound more organized than it really was. The way I picture this scenario playing out is that, you know, the Missouri militia had spent the night of October 31st bombarding the Mormon leaders with insults and threats, but the Mormons hadn't officially surrendered at that point, so they were prisoners of war. The militia couldn't do anything to them. But once the Mormons had officially surrendered the next day, it was a victory for the Missouri militia, and they were probably half slammed with dirty whiskey by the time evening rolled around after they had spent all day disarming and looting the Mormons. I'll bet that a bunch of the Missouri militia wanted nothing more in the world than to shoot Joe on the spot and be done with the whole Mormon problem right then and there, once and for all. So a court-martial was the only thing Lucas could do to satiate the Missouri in bloodthirst, but it was entirely illegal. Joe and the Mormon leaders needed to stand proper trial in a civilian court of law, but General Lucas seemed to have other plans. Here's an excerpt from Stephen Lesur's book, page 182, quote, Lyman White reported that during the proceedings, General Moses Wilson of Jackson County called him aside and promised to release him if he provided evidence against the Mormon prophet. White promptly refused, but told the general, if you will give me the boys I brought from Diamond yesterday, I will whip your whole army. White, you are a strange man, said Wilson, but if you will not accept my proposal, you will be shot tomorrow morning at eight. Shoot and be damned, White replied. Lyman White is such a fucking badass. I love this guy. Continuing further on in the passage, at midnight, Lucas issued the following order to Donovan. Sir, you will take Joseph Smith and the other prisoners into the public square of Far West and shoot them at nine o'clock tomorrow morning. Whatever Lucas's feelings regarding the necessity of this situation, he doubtless realized that the court-martial and execution of civilians was illegal. Consequently, if Donovan carried out the order, it would help to justify Lucas's action and shield him from any subsequent criticism. Had the prisoner's own friend and lawyer carried out the sentence, few would have questioned its expediency. Continuing on further, Donovan returned the following note to Lucas. It is cold-blooded murder. I will not obey your order. My brigade shall march for liberty tomorrow morning at 8 o'clock, 
and if you execute those men, I will hold you responsible before an earthly tribunal. So help me, God. Donovan's indignant refusal, for which he was never called to account, prevented the execution of the Mormon prisoners. Neither Lucas nor the other officers pursued the matter further. Lucas, perhaps embarrassed by his hasty and unlawful tribunal, later denied that the court-martial was held. End quote. General Donovan was a great guy and a badass. I mean, Donovan, who'd been Joe and White's lawyer for that September trial and had been one of the few people in the Missouri militia the Mormons could trust, essentially just saved the lives of Joe and the other captured leaders. Had Lucas given that order to any other general present in the militia, it may have been carried out, and Joe never would have lived to see the saints reach Nauvoo. It literally came down to one person who was a friend of the Mormons for this illegal court-martial and death sentence to not be carried out. Legally speaking, that is way too damn close for comfort, okay? When one person who is more moral than the group mentality is the check to stop a public lynching, something went wrong way further up the line. So we have to remember, General Lucas wasn't the head military authority in the field. He was operating under General Clark, to whom the extermination order was originally addressed, who was still two days away from arriving at the militia camp out in Far West. If Lucas were credited with putting down the Mormon rebellion by forcing a surrender and then subsequently killing off the Mormon leadership to properly quell the fanatics... He would have been seen by every anti-Mormon Missourian as a hero. You know, it would have been an amazing career move. It would have established General Lucas as the man who stopped those damn religious fanatics from taking over the whole state of Missouri. But thanks to General Donovan's sober intellect and willingness to uphold the law, regardless of how unpopular that stance is, Joe and the leadership were taken to Richmond, Ray County to have a proper civilian court, which we'll get into next episode. But to try and put all of this in perspective, let's read a couple of Missouri newspapers to see how the public perceived this whole ordeal. Now, these are all hosted on SydneyRigdon.com, which is one of Dale Broadhurst's many sites. You know, it's, it's a reasonably trustable historical resource. There will be a link to this in the the show notes. The first I'm going to read is from the Jeffersonian Republican out of Jefferson City, November 3rd, 1838. Now, keep in mind for all of these uh, newspaper clippings, news traveled a bit slower back then. So this was published after the surrender had already taken place. And all of these newspaper articles were working with about a 10 to a 15 day lag from what actually happened until it reached print. So this is, um, as I said, from the Jeffersonian Republican, November 3rd, 1838, quote, the Mormon war again, distressing news headline. It is with the most heartfelt regret. We this week spread before our readers the reality of all the accusations against the deluded and troublesome people who are ravaging the counties of Davies and Caldwell and carrying destruction and consternation along with their movements. After reading the following documents, which we have been politely favored with, can a feeling and patriotic people long debate what course to pursue? We will answer no. The country is already in arms and are marching to the relief of their distressed fellow citizens. Our county has met with full requisition of the governor, and her troops are already on the wing. The mounted troops from Gasconade left here on yesterday about 100 in number, well armed and equipped for a siege such as they will most likely encounter. From later on in the paper, there's a separate headline that says, Still later from the war. In addition to the foregoing, the governor yesterday received an express from General Atchison and Lucas, confirming the above statements. The Mormons are now in a perfect state of rebellion and are beyond all doubt the aggressors, setting the laws of the country at defiance. The express from General Atchison brought also a communication from General Clark with information that he was then on his way to the seat of war with 500 men, that 500 more were to join him that day. He is doubtless by this time at Richmond, end quote. 
Here's another one from uh, The Western Star. This is published out of Liberty, November 6th, 1838. And it's referring to when Boggs fired General Atchison for unknown reasons. And this was a shared general perspective of many newspapers at the time. Quote, The course of Governor Boggs and superseding General Atchison, we hear much complaint about. Why the governor did this, we are at a loss to know. So far as we have heard an expression of opinion, the people appear to be satisfied with Mr. Atchison as a general, end quote. Uh, this is a clip out of the Far West, and this is out of Liberty, published November 10th, 1838. Quote, Just as our paper was going to press, we received a communication from General Lucas giving the stipulations of the treaty made by him and the Mormons. It will be recollected that we stated that General Atchison and his staff returned home, having considered himself virtually ordered from the field by Governor Boggs, who assigned the command to General Clark of Howard County. General Lucas was in command of the troops previous to and at the time of the surrender of the Mormons. The matter was entirely settled before the arrival of General Clark. What motive could have operated on Governor Boggs for excluding General Atchison from any command? We do not pretend to know, but this we do know, that he has done himself very little credit by so illiberal a course of procedure. General Lucas states that the officers and men under his command conducted themselves in a manner that will ever recommend them to the highest approbation. Here is a, a quote from the bottom of that article, quote, there will be a dinner given to General Atchison on Monday next at the Liberty Hotel as a tribute of the high regard and esteem entertained for his personal character and his meritorious and prudent course in late difficulties with the Mormons. The citizens of this and the surrounding counties are respectfully invited, end quote. You know, that, that article there really captured how well general atchison and lucas did in this case kind of disparaging governor boggs for making such terrible decisions and it gets to a broader point that um you know dealing with the mormons it was a tough situation for any military leader or politician i i mean <laughs> governor boggs made all of the wrong possible moves and you know he had his career was essentially ended after this but governor uh but General Atchison and General Lucas, uh, General Donovan, all of these these important military leaders, General Clark especially, went on to have very successful careers. I think that just goes to show when you hang out on the right side of history and you stick to your legally defensible guns, good things eventually happen. Um, the next one I'm going to read is from the Western Emigrant, and this is out of Boonville, published November 15th, 1838. Quote, just as our paper was going to press, a portion of the guards have returned from the Mormon War, from whom we have gathered a few particulars. Our informants state that Joe Smith and the other leaders are to be put on their trial at Richmond, Ray County, and 47 other Mormons are to be tried at the same place. It is not true that the Mormons are to be sent out of the state forthwith but are allowed to remain at present with the distinct understanding that they are not to make another crop in Missouri, but to leave it between this and next summer. The forces are all disbanded and sent home except one troop of cavalry from Cole County, which will be retained until the Mormon trials are over. The circuit court for Ray County commenced its session on Monday the 11th instant, at which term it is expected the trial of Joe Smith and other Mormons will come on. These facts may be relied on as true, as we have them from persons immediately from the spot on whose statements reliance may be placed, end quote. That's true. So this was, um, this Western immigrant actually vetted their sources and they published good, hard, solid facts in the, that last article that we read. So it was important that we parse out the, the ones that were working off of rumors and whatnot from earlier on. And the ones that come out, you know, 10, 15 days after all this occurs, that they're actually able to go and investigate these stories and get solid sources, you know, as it gets a little bit later on, they tend to be a bit more accurate. Um, the next one is from the Southern Advocate, and this is out of Jackson County, published November 17th, 1838. Quote, headline, The Mormons. We are happy to learn that our difficulties with this deluded people are probably ere now terminated. Our latest intelligence, derived from the Jeffersonian Republican of the 10th instant, justifies the belief 
though we are really apprehensive that there will be no permanent peace and tranquility in that quarter of the state while these fanatics are permitted to remain. We are informed by the Jeffersonian that General Lucas had captured 400 Mormons in an engagement at Far West, among whom was the ringleader Joe Smith with four others of the principal offenders who were by orders of the governor to be delivered over to General Clark for safekeeping until tried by the civil authority at headquarters in Richmond Ray County. We further learn from the same paper that an engagement had also taken place in Caldwell County in which 35 Mormons were killed without any loss of our citizens. It is said, too, that they are fast leaving the state, and this, in our opinion, is their best policy, end quote. So, of course, that's referring to the Hans Mill massacre. So they didn't exactly vet the information concerning that. Eh, 35 Mormons were not killed. Um It was 18, but uh, it does show that they were hearing rumors and they were trying to vet them and they were looking to other sources and newspapers and informants to try and vet that information. The media was really trying to ascertain the truth out of this. The next one that I'm going to read, um, I believe this is our last one. Yeah, this is the last one and it's from the Western Star and it's out of Liberty published November 20th, 1838, quote, Some 25 of 30 Mormons were discharged, and about 35 are retained for indictment and trial, some for treason against the state, some for murder, some for accessories to murder, and some for arson, burglary, robbery, and larceny. We are informed the testimony discloses many facts which have not yet been published to the world, but not deeming it proper to make them the subject of newspaper comment before the trials of the accused, we forbear their disclosure." We are not apprised with certainty what steps will be taken for the safe custody of the prisoners, but think it most probable they will be divided and sent to the jails of the most convenient counties having jails. They are at present under the guard of a part of Captain Bogart's company of militia, General Clark having disbanded all his troops by order of the governor. End quote. The media really hyped up public opinion against the Mormons. And as we read, often conveyed false information based on rumors and hearsay. But these were merely relevant extracts, okay? When I put Mormon War 1838 in my search bar at newspapers.com, instantly there are 385 matches, ranging from the Columbia Democrat out of Pennsylvania to the Weekly Standard out of North Carolina. This Mormon war, which had finally come to an end, was spoken of and rumored around by everybody in the country. People who had previously never heard of the Mormons were hearing gossip and reading newspaper articles about this sect of religious fanatics burning through Missouri and waging war on the state militia, being massacred at a mill, and finally surrendering to the superior forces of General Lucas at the hands of the Missouri government. This was the craziest thing most of these people had heard since the burning of the capital by British troops 24 years prior. Never in American history had something like this actually happened before. I mean, never had a religious sect waged open warfare against the American government. Nobody knew what to think. Even now, looking back on it, I'm not sure what to think about this. The day following Lucas's court-martial for the leadership, committees went through Far West and Diamond, appraising the value of the Mormon goods that were surrendered. And consequently, the Mormons were also billed for all the expenses of the conflict, which was later withdrawn due to being unconstitutional. I mean, we did it to Germany in World War I, but yeah, we didn't do it to the Mormons in 1838. That's good. General Clark the commanding officer of every single militiaman in the field, finally arrived two days later on November 4th and said he would uphold the surrender terms negotiated or well dictated by General Lucas. The Mormon prisoners were taken to Richmond for their designated civilian trial set to begin on November 12th, which is where we're going to pick up episode 50. You know, I'm, I'm kind of zooming out a little bit here. When I was on Cognitive Dissonance, episode 229, that was over a year and a half ago, Tom made a point, and it stuck with me for a long time. 
We were talking about Mark Hoffman at the time and how he had bombed two people and nearly killed himself all because of, well, Mormon history. Tom said, big fish, little pond. You know, and it summarizes everything about Mormonism. But the thing about this little pond is there's no visible bottom to it. And I don't think anybody knows all the big fish that lurk in the shadowy depths, unexplored leagues beneath the surface. You know, we're only capable of exploring one small feature at a time with a laser pointer, but no mechanism exists to light up the entirety of the endlessly unexplored depths that exist within this brief snapshot of history. One thing is for certain, it requires hands-on research and tireless dedication to truth. My two favorite concepts and pastimes in the world. That being said, we have a very exciting announcement coming up on episode 50 involving those two concepts. That's coming in two weeks from when this episode airs. Hopefully some people out there will be interested in helping to illuminate more of the convoluted perplexity which so wonderfully embraces all of Mormon history. You know, it's it's been a ride so far getting Joe and friends up to the 1838 Mormon War in Missouri. But the Nauvoo years lie on the horizon. And I feel like we may be spending more episodes like this where it takes us an hour and a half to detail the events of essentially three days of Mormon history. You know, I'm excited, but at the same time, I'm a bit intimidated by this historical mountain looming in the distance. We are going to be relying upon and leveraging the research of many scholars, much like we've leveraged Stephen LeSueur and H. Michael Marquardt for this whole 1838 Missouri conflict, because, you know, they're they're trained historians and they've done the work of reconstructing this information in a concise and sensible way. But I guess that might kind of be the sales pitch, you know, with which to end this show. These books that I reference are truly invaluable. When I cite these amazing biographies and historiographies or read large excerpts from them, don't take that as all the information you need to get from those books. Support more of this research by buying these books and reading them for yourself. You'll gain a much richer understanding of Mormon history which I've only really come to appreciate these past two years. And even better, you can call me out when I inevitably fuck things up, as I'm often wont to do. You know, historical studies aren't anything without peer review and critique leading to corrections. And I can't do that without anybody calling out the presented information. And I guess that's kind of a roundabout way of just saying, you know, thank you all for listening, and thank you even more for engaging when circumstances require. It's time for Mormon Mimsies. If I show you something, promise you won't tell? Like a secret? Really? Cool. All right, it is time for Mormon Mimsy. Here is last week's quote. Here I accidentally became acquainted with Joseph Smith, your late prophet, and learned various particulars respecting his family. At the time when I first met with them near Palmyra, they were living in wretched poverty and, in fact, were hardly superior to common vagrants. The father, old Joseph Smith, was an irreligious and drunken fellow, and the mother was little better than her husband. And when I first met with your prophet in 1825, he was about 20 years of age and notorious like others of his family, as a money digger, and withal as a drunken, lying, and dissipated profligate, end quote. All right, the question for that Mormon Mimsy was, did that, quote, come from Eber Howe's Mormonism Unveiled, of the many affidavits that are included in it? And the question was answered by the winner of last week's Mormon Mimsy, Stephen Pompey, again, He called it out perfectly, the California Crusoe or the lost treasure found. And I said, uh, you know, so who uh, extra credit? Yeah, yeah, got extra credit. And of course, Stephen Pompey said, Dr. Williams, chapter five. And that is essentially true 
But that's a bit of a problem because Robert Richards might have been it or might have been C.C. Weil or one of those might have been a pen name of the other. There's a bit of question given the historical record who actually gave this quote, but it was um, given the wording of it given from a firsthand account of somebody who met with the Smiths and lived in 1825. So very nicely done. Stephen Pompey is on a two episode winning streak from two weeks ago and last week. Let's get this week's Mormon Mimsy and see who can pull this one out. All right, here is the quote. This demagoguery and political corruption has caused an innocent man to be immolated in a Missouri dungeon for upwards of eight months without the slightest evidence of his guilt or even the most remote evidence of crime leading to his committal. He was taken without process and committed to a jail upon mere supposition and finally acquitted without any shadow of proof having been adduced from beginning to end." This is the way that Missouri treats free-born American citizens, and they can obtain no redress, end quote. So, my question for this week's Mormon Mimsy is, to whom is this quote referring? Who was it that spent so much time in a Missouri prison unjustly with no evidence against them? We will have to find out. If you want to play along, you can do so by going to the Naked Mormonism Facebook page and finding this week's Mormon Mimsy, or you can go to uh, Twitter and hashtag it Mormon Mimsy, and let's see if Stephen Pompey can go on a a three-week winning streak here, or if he's going to be dethroned. (laughs) Alrighty, we need to thank our Hall of Famer patrons. Of course, these are the patrons who have been supporting for the longest time and have really formed the backbone and the foundation of this uh this venture and it's, it's super appreciated so we have preston jay chris and christy tyler judy frank clara and tim dario mindy randy colette greg eric clint scott philip stewart zena corinne david howard sean doug dunan joseph Bevan, Jim, Aaron, Sarah, George, and Elizabeth. Thank you all so much. You are the patrons who really put the work in and give your hard-earned dollars to continue and perpetuate this research. Um, So thank you all. All right, just a heads up. This episode, as I said at the beginning, is airing on March 2nd. On March 6th, we have our second installment of Nemo Home Evening. That is for those of you who support on Patreon.com slash Naked Mormonism. And for this Nemo Home Evening, we have a very special guest, Andrew Torres of the Opening Arguments podcast. Super stoked to have him on and to be talking with all of you. Who knows what the, the conversation will hold I know Andrew is full of a lot of very useful information, so we might stick on Mormonism. We might just do a huge, you know, legal Q&A because he's just an endless wealth of information and I'm super stoked to have him on. So be keeping an eye on your email that you support through Patreon.com and you will be receiving a link to the Google Hangouts where we will be holding that uh, second installment of our Nemo Home Evening. Once again, that is on March 6th, starting at 6 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. All right, I think that's everything for this week's episode. Next week is going to be a discussion episode with somebody I've uh, been wanting to get on for quite some time since he rose to prominence in uh, Mormon and ex-Mormon historical circles. And this is going to be interesting. This this is going to be one of those conversation episodes you probably don't want to miss. But that's it for this week's episode, of course. We need to shut it down, but before doing so, there are much needed thanks to give out there. First, I need to thank Demonista for running the Facebook page. I also need to thank The Real Emma Hale for running the Twitter handle. Thank you both for doing that. I also need to thank Craig Keeling for providing the artwork used in this show. Go to weirdmormonshit.com to see his blog. Of course, I need to thank Jason Camo for providing the music in the show used with his permission. Go to alaststateofmind.com to download his music there. Legal counsel for the podcast is provided by the law offices of P. Andrew Torres. Be sure to check out Opening Arguments, a fantastic podcast, or just come hang out with us on the 6th. If you'd like to leave a voicemail talking about the show or anything that's on your mind or just something that you learn about Mormon history, you can do so at 864-NAKED-MO, 864-625-3366. 
Of course, the show wouldn't go without all of the patrons who support the show, but if you don't have hard-earned cash to spare, you can always go to iTunes, Stitcher, or your podcasting app of choice and leave a five-star review. Or you can spread the word by sharing the show on your favorite social media platforms or to your friends and family. God forbid if they're Mormon. And, of course, I needed to thank all of the unflappably brilliant listeners out there once again for lending me your ear. I hope to talk to you next time here on the Naked Mormonism Podcast.
The preceding podcast is a production of Ground Gnomes, LLC, all rights reserved.